Okay, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me, thanks for showing up. Um, as you know from the introduction, I'm in private practice in Phoenix, Arizona, which uh, you might wonder why is this guy talking about heartworm disease from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, before that, I was in, uh, in the University of Texas A&M University for 26 years in a highly endemic area. That's where I um, got my interest in heartworm disease uh, and then continued it on uh, even in Phoenix. And um, my um, experience in Phoenix uh, has changed my perspective a little bit and uh, changed my understanding of heartworm disease uh, as well. Um, what we're going to talk about today, at least in the first uh, um, section that I have, is we're going to talk about the use of echocardiography um, in heartworm disease. And the title that they gave me is Echocardiography, Is It Needed in Heartworm Positive Animals? Okay. So if you ask a cardiologist you need an echo, it's sort of like asking your insurance salesman if you need a little more coverage, okay? Um, we always want to say, yes, we want to have an echo, okay? That being said, even though heartworm disease is a disease of primarily pulmonary vasculature, as we know, it can affect the heart. And so when you look at the question of do you need echo or is echo needed in heartworm positive animals, you respond like you almost always respond in the medical community. It depends. Right? It depends on whether or not you're looking at dogs or cats, you're looking at symptomatic animals, asymptomatic animals. So what we'll do is go through a couple of the sort of the what ifs or it depends questions that we have. So one of the first things to think about is, are you looking at a dog or a cat? When I look at dogs and cats, we'll talk about diagnosis of heartworm disease in cats a little bit later on. When I look at a dog and a cat, I think they're very, very different. And if you take a cat, for example, we'll talk about cats first, is I have to look at a cat and say, do I suspect it has an adult infection or do I expect or anticipate that maybe it has a pre-adult infection? We can talk about the differences of how those animals might present. Remember, with a pre-adult infection, echocardiography is not going to help us at all. Why would we even do an echo in a cat that we think has a pre-adult infection? There's no way we're going to see the parasite. No chance it will see the parasite. In that situation, we're probably trying to rule things out versus rule things in. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about symptomatic animals and, and confirmatory tests or not. Now in a cat, if I believe a cat has an adult infection, and establishing a definitive diagnosis of adult infection can be challenging in the cat, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a later session, but if I believe a cat has an adult infection, then the answer is echocardiography useful is, in my opinion, yes, absolutely yes because we can find those worms, we can rule out other diagnoses. And if you look at the life cycle, you're trying to think about, do I worry about a pre-adult infection in this cat? Echo, probably not very useful, but it'll help me rule out other causes for their clinical symptomatology. If I believe this cat has an adult infection, then echocardiography is a really useful tool. When I look at the dog, dogs are different. Dogs are very, very different. Because when I look at a dog, I anticipate that I'm not looking at a pre-adult infection, right? If we're going to suspect heartworm disease in a dog, we're not expecting a pre-adult infection. We're not going to be able to establish that diagnosis, and these animals are almost certainly not going to be symptomatic. So when I look at echocardiography in dogs, I look at what am I trying to find? What bit of information is an echocardiogram going to give me? The majority of the dogs that you see with heartworm infection, how do they present to you? They present to you for routine wellness examination, right? And you're vigilant and you test them every year and you find them in their asymptomatic state. Early detection, the odds are that the echo is not going to help me. When you do an echo, what do you look for? When you look at an echocardiogram, when you order an echocardiogram, not necessarily for heart disease, but for any disease process, what do you want to know? What does the echo tell you that radiographs don't tell you or something like that? It tells you about function, tells you about anatomy. That's the primary aspects of uh, echocardiography. Well, in the dog, in a, an asymptomatic, an asymptomatic case, almost certainly there's not going to be any anatomic changes. And unless it's a really tiny dog, you're never going to find functional or functional changes or be able to identify the parasite. So when you look at dogs, you have to ask yourself, do I look at symptomatic versus asymptomatic? And if you're looking at a dog with heartworm disease, you're trying to decide, would an echo be an appropriate way to spend this client's money? Would it give me information that would be helpful? 
And I would argue that if you have a dog that is asymptomatic, the answer is probably no. Probably going to give you very little data that's going to change your diagnosis, your additional diagnostic tests, your prognosis, or your therapy. So probably not a great indication. How about in a symptomatic dog? A symptomatic dog is a little different story. Because in a symptomatic dog, one of the things I'm trying to figure out is, are the clinical signs that I see associated with heartworm infection or not? So coming from a highly endemic area, College Station, Texas, where I practiced for 26 years, we used to refer to some of these dogs as, oh, by the way, heartworm dogs. And what I meant by that is they were antigen positive, they had an adult infection, but their symptomatology for which they were being presented was associated with an underlying, a different underlying cardiac disease. And I think in a symptomatic dog that is heartworm antigen positive, it's important for us to make sure, especially if they're a predisposed breed, a breed predisposed to other diseases that might cause similar symptomatology, I think it's our responsibility to try and rule in or rule out that disease process. Now, radiographic evaluation is important, and when I talk about symptomatic dogs, there are dogs that are chronically symptomatic or dogs that have become acutely symptomatic. And when I talk about chronically symptomatic, these are the dogs that have chronic weight loss, uh, abdominal distension that has been progressive over time, oftentimes either associated with the development of caval syndrome or like, more likely associated with severity of pulmonary vascular changes, pulmonary hypertension, and resultant right-sided congestive heart failure. And then you have the dogs that have acute symptomatology, totally asymptomatic dog who has an acute episode of respiratory distress, similar to the radiographs we're showing right now. And that dog probably had an embolic event, most likely, adult infection, embolic event. In that scenario, I think echocardiography is helpful because it gives me some insight into the severity of the ch changes because most acute changes are associated with chronic background changes that are exacerbated by an event. So when I look at these guys echocardiographically, I'm trying to figure out how severe is their pulmonary hypertension, how important are their anatomic changes, how much of this do I believe is reversible, how much of this do, do I believe might be associated with underlying other diseases. So when I look at echocardiography in dogs and cats, I look at them very, very differently. And I would say the majority of dogs with asymptomatic adult infections will not benefit from an echocardiogram. And that's heresy for a cardiologist to say. What, you don't want to echo that dog? Every dog should get echoed every year, right? That's how we should manage them, just in case we're going to find some disease. That's not the case. We're not going to help an asymptomatic dog with, um, with an echocardiogram. We're not going to change their prognosis. We're not going to change what we do therapeutically. However, if we have a dog that's symptomatic, it's going to be really important to try and rule in or rule out other disease processes. What do I think about? When I think about a dog with, an echo, with symptoms and an echocardiogram, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to rule in important anatomic changes associated that would be compatible with heartworm disease. The other thing that I'm trying to look at is I'm trying to decide, does this dog have cable syndrome or not? If I have a dog that's symptomatic, dog has uh, signs of right-sided heart failure, how are we going to establish that diagnosis? We're going to establish that diagnosis primarily by physical examination and history, but I'm going to confirm that echocardiographically. Before I take that dog to surgery, I want to know if he's got worms in his tricuspid valve. Very easy, straightforward diagnosis. How about in the cat? Symptomatic cat who I suspect has an adult infection. What am I looking for? I'm looking for worms. I want to find worms. There's limitations, of course. The kind of equipment that you have, operator expertise, but the majority of cats with adult infections, if you have an echocardiogram performed on a cooperative cat, that's a big, big difference, of course, okay? Cooperative cat with appropriate uh, equipment by a well-trained examiner, probably looking at 80% sensitivity, probably one of the most sensitive ways we can look for adult infections, at least in the cat. And we do that with all our chylothorax cats looking for the potential for heartworm. So, what I'm trying to do echocardiographically is first confirm, are the changes that I see compatible with the result of important adult heartworm infection? And can I identify worms? Identifying worms typically is either cable syndrome in the dog 
or you find the worms typically in the main pulmonary artery in the cat. Now, what else am I trying to do? If you're in a highly endemic area, you have to recognize that you're going to have dogs that have heartworm infection come in with symptoms that would be compatible with important heartworm disease, compatible with right-sided congestive heart failure, potentially associated with pulmonary hypertension, that do not have those signs. They do not have severe enough heartworm disease to cause their signs. Why are they presenting to you? They have a background heartworm infection, but they have other underlying diseases. The things that I usually think about as far as right-sided heart failure in the dog is I want to rule out congestive heart failure, typically associated with dilated cardiomyopathy in a large breed dog, less likely valvular heart disease in a small breed dog. And then I want to rule out pericardial disease. Pericardial disease is a common cause for right-sided symptoms, and it's really important to rule out those other important primary cardiac diseases before you go ahead and start adulticide therapy on an animal that may not respond favorably to adulticide therapy because their symptoms are not associated with it. How about in the cat? Well, what do cats get? Cats get myocardial disease. The top three differentials in the cat for heart failure. Heart, um, myocardial disease followed by myocardial disease and the third one's myocardial disease. They get forms of myocardial disease. So it's important in a cat who you suspect might have symptomatology associated with adult heartworm infection to make sure that you rule out primary myocardial disease. Echocardiography is a way to rule that out. Okay. So if you think about the, the sort of the indications, canine versus feline, okay? So for me, I look at cats and say, for cats, echocardiography actually serves as a primary diagnostic. When I suspect an adult infection, echocardiography is included in my armamentarium of establishing a definitive diagnosis. In dogs, I really look at it as a tertiary diagnostic. I'm going to do antigen testing first. I'm probably going to do radiographic evaluation in those dogs long before I do an echocardiogram. Why is that? Because I'm probably not going to find the worms on a, a dog. If he's asymptomatic, it's unlikely that I'm going to find changes in his heart that would change what I do therapeutically or change how my discussion goes with my client associated with prognosis or follow-on care. For me and dogs, echocardiography is limited to dogs that are obviously symptomatic. And the things that I'm looking at is I want to rule out non-heartworm causes. We talked about pericardial disease, primary myocardial disease, very commonly valvular heart disease. I also want to stage severity. The amount of anatomic changes that we see in these dogs may give us insight into long-term prognosis, at least long-term performance prognosis. And then it can, in some situations, guide therapy. So if I can establish that a dog has caval syndrome, now my therapy is dictated by what I saw echocardiographically, and it allows me to optimize care for that patient. Thank you.